coming by car through the back entrance of the Scottish Parliament, photographers poised for shots and examined in the back seat, his mask hiding his expression. As soon as the opening statement started, his defiant mood became clear. This was about to pack a punch. The failures of leadership are many and obvious. And yet, convener, not a single person has taken responsibility, not a single resignation, not a single sacking. The government acted illegally, but somehow nobody's to blame. Scotland hasn't failed. Its leadership has failed. He went on to reveal why, after years of scrutiny of his own behaviour, he still felt compelled to speak at the committee. And for him, it was a message that bears repeating. I watched an astonishment on Wednesday when the First Minister of Scotland, the First Minister of Scotland, used a COVID press conference, a COVID press conference, to effectively question the result of a jury. Still, I said nothing. Well, today, that changes. The evidence started slowly, but the second half ramped up, with Alex Salmon questioned on key meetings that would show who knew what, when, particularly around the date of the 2nd of April, when he went to Nicola Sturgeon's home. For Mr Salmon, the topic was crystal clear. So when Peter Murrell said it was a government matter and Nicola Sturgeon said it was a party matter, it would appear that Peter Murrell was right on this occasion. It, it was a, a government matter. It was about the complaints okay. against me. Then the session moved on to the big questions of who's responsible for handling this. The Conservative MSP, Murdo Fraser, asking just who should go. Alex Salmon had some suggestions. I think the people responsible for the disaster of the judicial review, I think uh, the, in terms of Scottish Government, the Crown Office, uh, and in, in terms of the, the overall uh, approach, the people who are responsible uh, should resign. The people I've named uh, as I have the evidence for their behaviour. Uh, they should be all considering their, uh, their positions. If the First Minister has broken the ministerial code, should she resign? Not for me. I, I believe the First Minister has broken the ministerial code, but the, the, you know, that is a finding that can be discussed, at least by this committee, uh, by Mr James Hamilton. It's not the case that every minister who breaks the ministerial code resigns. I mean, your own uh, party would have a, an example of that relatively recently. Uh, it depends on what is found and, and the, the degree by which the ministerial code has been broken. I've got no doubt that Nicola has broken the ministerial code, but it's not for me to suggest the concept, what the consequences should be. It's important to remember this Holyrood inquiry has been brought about to look into the government's mishandling of sexual harassment complaints against Mr Salmon. But what also matters is the impact that this can potentially have on voters come May. Nicola Sturgeon rejects Mr Salmon's claims and has insisted there is not a shred of evidence that there was a conspiracy against Alex Salmon and has denied misleading Parliament. After hours of evidence, it's a longer session than anticipated. What's left behind is a mountain of questions for Nicola Sturgeon and next week it'll be her turn. I shall tell reporting. Well, I'm joined now by one of the Scottish National Party's MPs, Alan Smith. Alan Smith, thank you so much for coming on the programme. Is your party about to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory? Well, I certainly hope not. Uh, I, I, Alex Salmond remains a nationalist. He's in favour of independence. And it, it, it's been a grim, a grim day for us, uh, no disguising that fact. Uh, this is uh, a really sensitive, sad state of affairs. Uh, there's clearly been things that have gone wrong in the Scottish Government's handling of the initial inquiry and uh, uh, the prosecution of these uh, complaints. Uh, so it's right that we're ventilating these, and a Holyrood inquiry is a serious thing, and it's right that we go through the gears. It was a four-and-a-half-hour uh, evidence session today, and it was useful to actually get some of this stuff debunked and on the record, because what we've seen over the last 18 months is a series of wacky conspiracy theories being put into the mix by other actors. So today, even... Alex Salmond debunked one of them himself. Uh, one of the, the, the mm -hmm. things that had been put about was that this was a conspiracy to stop him standing in a by-election in 2017. He himself debunked that today quite explicitly. So it was a useful session with a lot, to, a lot to be thinking about yet. But there's been a lot of allegations made, but the evidence remains still pretty right. thin on the ground. And Nicola Sturgeon still to have her say. 
Well, it's, it shines a very unseemly light on the inner workings, on the entrails of the SNP, I have to say. Are you now hoping that it's just all too complicated for, really to kind of, for the public to really care about? Oh, no, I want us to get to the truth. Uh, I, I, I'm doing my best uh, as, uh, as, as a true and loyal faithful servant of the party to, to be fair to everybody. I mean, but, but of paramount importance here is that in Scotland we take complaints of sexual misconduct seriously. We also take the anonymity and privacy and protection of complainers seriously too. So if an allegation is made, then it needs to be backed up. And the trigger point for the outrage surely is when the allegation is proven, not when the allegation is made. So some of the allegations that we've seen from some actors within this, that uh, somehow the Crown Office has been leaned upon by the government and the government leaned mm. on the parliament, that, that's demonstrable Trumpian garbage. Alex Salmond is entitled to okay. ventilate the whole process. It was useful for him to be talking today, but uh, as I say, the evidence remains thin on the ground. Well, indeed, well, everyone is entitled to the truth on this one. So should all the documents that Alex Salmon wants to have made public be made public now in the interest of truth? Well, there's, there's a court order protecting the anonymity of the complainants and uh, no court anywhere, no parliament anywhere would operate in breach of that. And there's a, there's, a, there's a difference, of course, between the Scottish Parliament and Westminster in that the law officers and the officers of the parliament are subject to the court orders in a way that Westminster is different. Uh, now, that's not my worldview, but that's the reality of it. And of paramount importance here is the privacy and security of the complainers. So there, there, there is a legal process to go through on that. And I understand the Crown Office is looking at the latest request for information now. And they'll do that impartially and fairly and with the integrity they've shown throughout this process. Right. But with all this infighting that the whole world is witnessing right now, at the top echelons of the SNP, you know, how will your party be in a position to actually run an independent Scotland should it get to that. And that was his accusation today. And that's coming from a man who helped to create the modern SNP. Uh, it arguably is a reason why I'm in the SNP myself. Uh, it, uh, I, I worked with Alec for a number of years uh, over the piece. And uh, yes, he's got a major part to play in the movement's future as well, I hope. Uh, we do want to build an independent Scotland. But he himself said today that the institutions of Scotland are sound. Now, this has been a sensitive process, a tough process, but we're not at the end of it yet. It's right that we're ventilating this, and we're doing that without fear or favour. The Committee of Inquiry of Holyrood is looking into all these issues, slowly, properly, going through the gears, getting the information they need. Now, there are legal constraints to that, because the anonymity and safety of the complainer surely needs to come first. But mm -hmm. once we get the, the proper... Uh, conclusions to this. We'll need to see what lessons are learned for the future. But I, I really don't see that this is cutting through to the public about an independent Scotland or the SNP. I won't pretend we're having a fun time, ah. but I don't see that it's cutting through. OK. All right. Got to leave it there. Alan Smith, thank you very much indeed. Well, joining me now from Edinburgh is Ruth Davidson, leader of the Conservatives in the Scottish Parliament. Uh, thank you very much for coming on the programme. So is this feud uh, between Nicola Sturgeon and Alex Salmond going to save the union? Well, look, this at the moment isn't, first of all, about Nicola Sturgeon versus Alex Salmond. It's not about uh, the Scottish government uh, versus, you know, the opposition. This is actually about the institutions and the probity of government. This is about two women who brought forward serious sexual harassment complaints and they were failed. And the Scottish government failed them grossly. And in doing so, they acted unlawfully. They acted uh, their, um, the way in which they handled this was tainted by apparent bi bias. And today's committee investigation is about what the government did wrong, how things went wrong, who's responsible for them. And part of the issue that we've had with this committee is every time they try and shine the, you know, the, the sunlight and disinfectant on it, uh, the Scottish government is refusing to hand over the information that the committee needs. So, you know, there are serious questions to answer. And at the moment, the job of parliamentarians in the Scottish Parliament is to make sure that the Parliament is a, a credible and capable counterbalance to the executive, as parliaments mm. in all parts of the world need to be. So whose side are you on in all this? Well, again, this is, you know, a misnomer that it's it's a Salmond versus Sturgeon fight. Now, I was the leader of the Scottish Conservatives for eight years, three years up against Alex Salmond, uh, five years up against Nicola Sturgeon. I've uh, been in close quarters with both of them. I think active hostility to both has been witnessed on all sides. And, and you know, just because 
uh, I happen to think that Alex Salmond is a, a dreadful misogynist and an appalling man, it doesn't mean that the Scottish Government doesn't actually have questions to answer here. And as somebody that cares deeply about the Scottish Parliament, who's been in there for 10 years, who wants to see our institutions function and work, just as any Scot should, you know, yeah. I want to make sure that this litany of apparent cover-up okay. Um, that's been going on in the Scottish Government is not allowed to happen. The retraction of documents, right. the refusal to hand over um, votes in Parliament to make sure evidence is provided, being ignored, uh, having to go to courts to get documents. But, but hang on a minute, should, 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 being to should she resign? To answer questions. I mean, should this she is, resign? It's been poor stuff. Well, if what is alleged to have happened uh, has happened, then the ministerial code is absolutely clear that, yes, she should. But she is allowed due process. She will be up against the committee, up in front of the committee right. on Wednesday of next week. Pr and she has to answer these questions. OK. Priti Patel broke the ministerial code in London as Home Secretary and did not have to resign. So these are double standards, aren't they? Well, first of all, I don't sit in the House of Commons, and if the mem MPs and members of the House of Commons want to set up a committee inquiry to investigate Priti Patel, then they should go on and do that. My job as an MSP is to hold the government in Scotland to account, because that's what sitting in Holyrood is all about. But, but also, the ministerial code does allow for breaches in Scotland. I can't speak to the one in the UK government, because I've never served in the House mm. of Commons, I've never served in the UK government. But the Scottish ministerial code does allow for breaches to occur without a resignation. However knowingly misleading Parliament, in black and white, the text states that the penalty for that, that particular breach, is resignation. And that is one of the issues that okay. the First Minister will have to answer on Wednesday. In one line, the biggest asset for the Scottish National Party and Scottish independence is still called Boris Johnson. Isn't that true? No, I think the biggest... Uh, well, well, firstly, I, I don't think it has many assets because I want to see the Scottish... Uh, Sco Scotland stay part of the United Kingdom. I think the, the biggest asset for the United Kingdom uh, is our shared history, prosperity and our shared community. Okay. And I will always, I will always right. argue for that. Got to leave it there. Ruth Davidson, thank you very much indeed. Jackie. Thank you.